Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very be- pleased to be joined today by Edward Gross and Mark A. Altman, the authors of They Shouldn't Have Killed His Dog, the complete uncensored ass-kicking oral history of John Wick, Gun Fu, and the New Age of Action. Um, together, they co-authored, uh, in addition to this oral history, the 50-year mission, the complete uncensored oral history of Star Trek. It's a two-volume set. It's going to take up a lot of space on your on your bookshelf, but it's very much worth checking out if you are into the whole Star Trek thing. Uh, Mr. Gross is a veteran entertainment journalist. He's written for Fangorious and a fantastic SFX, bunch of other publications. Uh, Mr. Altman, also former entertainment journalist, um, in addition to uh, being the writer of uh, the the great indie movie Free Enterprise and an executive producer at a bunch of shows like Castle, Librarians, Pandora. Uh, thank you for being on the show, guys. Really appreciate it. No, oh, thanks for having us. Thank you, but you didn't announce the name of the the book, right? You have to say they shouldn't have killed his dog. <laughs> That's the only way I can say it. They should. I, 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 it's just all right. Let me try that it's one. Our more favorite time. title. They shouldn't have killed his dog. Yeah, it's that yeah, yeah, yeah. so. I got to yeah, chill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I That's chill, good. But... I know. I it just you know Ed came up with the title and. Uh, you, you can only say it that way. Otherwise, it just it doesn't have the impact. Right. All right. Well, it just uh, I want you to hear it that way in your head when you're reading the book. I'll, I... I'll link to it <laughs> in my in my newsletter. Everyone, make sure you you pick it up. Um, so let's talk. I I am I'm fascinated just by the actual production of these oral history style books. Uh, you know, I've I've actually never had an author on who has had written one before. So I'm pretty excited to talk to you guys uh, just about the actual mechanics of writing these things. Um, you know, when you are when you are first off, who came? Who, how did this book come into being? You know, did somebody at St. Martin's come to you and say, "Hey, we need a John Wick oral history"? Were you guys sitting around like, "Well, what can we do next? What do we What do we do?" next well it, 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 it's a funny story because it, it goes back about six years the genesis of this goes back before john wick because um you know ed's obviously a very prolific entertainment writer and it was a couple of years before the 50th anniversary of star trek and he's he's like you know mark maybe we should uh, you know get the band back together and do a star trek book for the anniversary and i was kind of wary of doing that and kept poo-pooing this, if that's an expression that people still use. And uh, I, we um, <laughs> essentially, I started reading this great book called I Want My MTV, which was an oral history. It was the first oral history I'd ever read. And then I read this is this is um, the Saturday Night Live oral history by live Tom Shales. Yeah. And and, uh, and I called up Ed, live from New York, thank you. Good call. Good help. Title. And um, I called up Ed and I said to him, uh, I said, Ed, uh, I know I said I wasn't interested in doing it, but maybe, maybe if we do the Star Trek book as an oral history, I said, that might be something of interest. And he goes, really? You do it? I'm like, maybe. Let's talk to her agent and let's see if she can get any interest and what the numbers are. And I said, maybe. And then she went out with it like in a 24 hour sold it for a bunch of money. I was like, oh, I guess we're doing (laughs) this. And Ed and I had the greatest time writing it. I mean, it was supposed to be one book. We, we overrode it. We overshot the moon landing by like God knows. So our, we, we told our editor it needs to be two books. And he says, I'll be the judge of that. And uh, he sent it to me. And I'll, and then uh, uh, we sent it to him on a Friday. On a Monday, he, he sent us an email. It's two books, which was like the ultimate compliment. And then that book did extremely well, which was great. And so we were stuck doing more. So we ended up doing, you know, Buffy and Galactica and James Bond, which was great, and Star Wars. So at Star Wars, I thought we were done. And, uh, you know, I was like, what else is there to write about that we like, you know? Um, and our editor called up and and, and said, you know, guys, um, would you be interested in doing a book on John Wick? And we both thought about it. And, you know, we thought that, you know, there are only, at the time, three John Wick movies, like, is it going to be a pamphlet? So we said we should really broaden the um, uh, the topic to gun fu in general because obviously it's been extremely influenced by uh, John Wick was extremely influenced by the Hong Kong films and 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 by the you know Matrix and then of course um, stuff like Atomic Blonde and Nowhere and stuff started coming out. So we wanted to broaden the focus, but we're like, yeah, we'll do that, and um, and that's how the book came to be. So even though. It was about what, a year and a half or something that two years ago they approached us about doing the book. It really goes back like six, seven yeah. years. You know, and, and the, I, so I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead no, I was just going to say, and these oral histories are, you know, because uh, you asked about the mechanics of it. And the one thing I want to emphasize, because it's the one thing reviewers say, some reviewers say that drives me crazy is these are just a bunch of random quotes thrown together. 
And mm. that's not what these books are. They are they are like right. jigsaw puzzles with, with intricate p- placing of the pieces. You know, it's really fascinating. I'm so glad you said that, Ed, because that is a source of much consternation. Oh, yeah. I mean, generally, I'm mean, obviously the reviews for the books have been extraordinary, but. Um, Occasionally, you get somebody who says, oh, all of this is a bunch of quotes thrown together. And the idea of an oral history, a good oral history, is to make it seem like the greatest dinner party in the world, where you get like 100 people who are involved with this movie or TV show, and they're all sitting around a table, and they're getting progressively drunker and being more and more honest throughout the meal. And by the end, it's like you got the whole story, you know, and 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 it's not like when we interview these people, we have to make sure that there's a narrative that one quote leads into the next. So like Ed says, it's 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 a puzzle, but also you're doing all those interviews, f- finding um, the architecture of the book, but also the good stories and what's interesting about it. And then getting uh, that whole Rashomon aspect where different people comment on the same thing and you're getting different perspectives, which is great because in a regular book, the author has to sort of be the voice of God to sort of say, this is the way it happened, like Cronkite or something. But in a oral history, you can have three different people commenting on the same thing and they could be saying something completely different and it's up to the reader to decide what really happened which i love that about oral histories well yeah that's that's one of the things i love about the structure of these books is that you will have you will have paragraphs where people are discussing the same same thing same basic thing same basic topic or idea and just coming to co- totally completely different conclusions and then you're 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 forced to to kind of uh as the reader to decide which you know you buy more or just to say, well, maybe both are true. Maybe, maybe, maybe it doesn't really matter. Um, how do you, when you, when you do, when you are doing these interviews and you get a contradiction like that, does like a little light bulb go off in your head? Like, yes, this is, this is going to look good next to, you know, somebody else's. Quote. Well, I find, I, I have found that sometimes you don't even realize it when they're saying it, but once you're going through it, like for instance, in the, in the Buffy angel book, we did the oral history of Buffy, the vampire slayer and angel. There's a bit where these two small bit part players were talking about working with David Boreanaz. And the woman said, oh, he was really lovely. He welcomed us and and made us feel at home and part of the family and that sort of thing. And the next quote is from the guy who says, David Boreanaz was a dick. And this is how he treated us. And it went back and forth like that. We were able to intercut back and forth. And that's where you get when one person says, that, it's like, oh, wait, so-and-so told me this. Which goes against that, but boy, is it going to flow yeah. into each other and, and tell the story from different points of view? So yeah, you know that's. Do you guys do you guys interview in tandem? Do you do you team up for for? No, uh, their... no, we barely talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, no, that's not true. But it's it's um, it, you know, we kind of like at the beginning we create our wish list, right? Of who we want to interview for a book. And then I cherry pick who I really he want does. to talk to. <laughs> oh, good! I got all the crack names. <laughs> Thanks, Jamar. <laughs> <laughs> and and then um, and then you know we both uh, uh, you know start to do interviews. Now Ed's process is very different. Ed, um, he's based in on the East Coast in New York. He does almost primarily all phone interviews, which are now I guess Zoom interviews. But at the time, these were mostly phone interviews. And um, I pre pandemic usually approach things very differently. I like to sit down with people in person because I'm on the West Coast uh, in LA. And so I would like to, you know, generally take people out to lunch or dinner or drinks because there's this great thing where you get through all your questions after about maybe 20 minutes or half hour, but you're still waiting for like your entree. And then you just sort of make small talk and then they really start to open up because like there's nothing left to talk about and they get comfortable and then they start to give you all this great stuff. Um, particularly if you're drinking, but, um, <laughs> it was, uh, so I, I find, I found like, I get a lot more out of people by talking to them in person. Although the John Wick book was the first book we wrote during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And so that was exclusively zoom, which was an interesting combination. It was it, like, I felt like I wasn't getting as much as I got at a meeting with person, but I got a lot more done because I could do a bunch of interviews in a day rather than if I was doing a lunch. Plus, it was, you know, I, I saved a lot of money <laughs> yeah, because I was spending my advance on, you know, nice lunches and drinks and things like that. But um, it was it was the Zoom was sort of in a way the best of both worlds because you could see them and, and, and make contact with them and um, still do pretty solid interviews. I liked it a lot better than a phone interview. Um, and uh, 
so it was pretty good. So if I wasn't able to interview people in person, the Zoom was the next best thing, I think. But Ed is a phone maven, and it's amazing. Ed can interview somebody. I'm, I'm in awe of this. Like 20 years ago, he could have interviewed. And he calls him over 20 years, and it's like, oh, it's Ed Gross. I don't know if you remember me. Of course I remember you. Ed Gross, I'll be happy to talk to you. I mean, I don't know how he does it. I don't think the people I talk to remember me 10 <laughs> minutes after I talked to him. Him is like 20 years. They're like, oh, my God, it's Ed Gross. It's so nice. How you been? And they're, and they're like, how was the interview? Oh, we talked for two hours, but we haven't started the interview. We're just like talking about our families and things. I'm like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> it's, and let me tell you about us. Not, even though we don't do the interviews t- in tandem, which Mark is right, it, it would never work if we were to do that. We talk over each other instead of uh, talking to the person. Uh, but we're so excited as we get these interviews that we're constantly communicating either text or a phone call saying, I just spoke to so-and-so. Yeah, I just spoke to this guy. And then this back and forth excitement in, in knowing that we're really getting names in here and crafting, beginning. The well, book. we kept trying to one up each other, which was yeah. the fun of the Star Trek book, because he'd get somebody and tell me, oh, you know, so-and-so said this. I'm like, oh, that's great. And then I do an interview. I call him. I say, well, you know, Ed, I did so-and-so and they said this. And and he's like, you know, and it got to the point where I said, stop competing with right. the Decker, which is a line <laughs> from Star Trek, the bunch of picture. And uh, and it was great because we raised our game. Like, I think I pushed Ed to be more aggressive and competitive, you know, to get this. And then, you know, he raised my game. And I think it was like, we didn't want to stop until the very end. Like we were doing interviews on that book on Star Trek and like the very end. And he was, I mean, I'll never forget. There was this, this one guy, an obscure guy in Star Trek history, this guy, Burton Armis. And uh, it was the guy in Superman that they named the cop after in 78 Superman, Armis. But he was um, a producer on the second season of Star Trek. The Next Generation. God, Ed, you know, Next Generation. And I said, I said, it'd be so great. If if some, by somebody he was long deceased, I'm like if only we had Burton Armis, he would really fill in some of the gaps and be great. And Ed says, I think I interviewed him once. And so he goes down to the basement, which we called the TARDIS, where he keeps all his archives. And all of a sudden he calls me back, and he's like, I found a micro cassette with an interview with Burton Armis that I never used for anything. <laughs> and I'm like, holy yeah. mackerel! And it was just it's the, that's the great thing about working with Ed because Ed's been doing this for thirty years. He's like interviewed everyone. So even if like someone was, you know, that was the great thing about the Star Trek book. Even though people were dropping like flies when we were writing it and a lot of people had passed away, same thing with the Bond book. Um, He had interviews with like a bunch of people to fill in some of the gaps where either people were deceased or, you know, they were very old and didn't really remember. And uh, it was... It's it really remarkable. That's the joy of working with Ed. It's not his personality. No, definitely not. I suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me ask about uh, using original material versus you know other other material. So, like, uh, I know I know sometimes you're reading uh, an oral history and you see a quote from somebody, you're like, oh wow, they talked to them, and then you go look in the sources in the back. It's pulled from an interview. That had been published some other somebody by somebody else. Mm-hmm. Sure. Are you guys? Are you? Are your interviews all exclusive? Are these all new for the book? Ninety nine percent. Okay. And I'm you know ninety nine percent. Sometimes if um someone and when I say ninety nine percent, I mean there are interviews. Some may we may have done fifteen years ago mm-hmm. from you know magazine or something, but there are interviews. What occasionally if we need to fill in a gap because someone's deceased or you know not accessible, we may you know um. Acquire a you make an arrangement with somebody the, we yeah, know the who's interviewed here. them, yeah. But um, you know, or you know, in 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 rare cases, if it, if um, it was like a canned press conference or something where they spoke publicly, we might grab that uh, comment if we need it, especially if it helps us tell the narrative. But ninety nine percent of it is is you know the interviews that we have done ourselves over the years. You know, not necessarily in the last two years when we're writing the book, mm-hmm. but you know, um, I mean, it could be you know something we did twenty years ago. I mean, I couldn't. For Star Trek, for instance, I went back to these cassettes of interviews I had done on the set of the first season of The Next Generation when I was in college, and it was really hard to listen to, <laughs> you know, these interviews because I was young. My It was just like I, I, I wasn't a seasoned uh, an interviewer, and it was really hard to listen to, but it was super helpful because um, I got a couple of, you know, great quotes from that and obviously i'd interviewed most of these people many many times since but it was it was the first time i couldn't believe that they hadn't deoxidized that these tapes were still good because you know they're from 30 years 30 years ago yeah um all right well let's talk let's talk about john wick let's talk about the reason the reason we're here the book uh why um two two two-part question here 
uh, and you and you've discussed this a little bit, but you know the the section uh, at the beginning that is the the kind of history of action movies, the rise of gun fu and all that. Um, I om- I mean I I felt like as I was reading this, this could be its own book. This could be its this could be its own book. So uh, in terms of like trying to figure out who to talk to for that and what you were going for, what was your what was your process there? Well, I I will tell you this. I'll tell you a secret that we haven't told anybody. There was a lot more gun fu that got oh, cut. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the problems is we've we've always had very large tomes that we published, and I think the feeling was for this subject, which is um, which doesn't have as dedicated a fan base, you know, as Star Trek, and who wants every bit of minutia, that the book should be a little thinner and less intimidating, you know, as a barrier to entry. So we actually cut. A, a lot of the gun fu mm-hmm. stuff early on um, and, and sort of abbreviated it. It's still pretty dense, but um, we, we, we cut a lot of that. So, yeah, I mean, I appreciate you saying that. And, and that was really interesting because we kind of had to find our thesis, you know, in, in terms of what was the impact of gun fu on John Wick and even what is gun fu, you know? Um, so uh, I think a lot of that came in the interviews, we were sort of i think i came up very early that in a way the original action film was arrival of a train in a station uh, but even that people couldn't agree on like it was, is that really not of course it's not an action right. film but it is right. the first case of sort of people viscerally responding to action in a film um but um it, it was very interesting because even the people we interviewed couldn't really agree as to what you know, a, a, a strict definition of gun fu and what constitutes gun fu versus just an action movie and when the birth of the action movie really was. And so I don't know if we necessarily have the answers, but we asked the question. But it was also like a domino thing falling backwards in the sense of you start with John Wick, right? And you're sitting there going, this this has ushered in a whole new age of action. Well, how do we get here? We got here from gun fu and gun fu led to John Wick. So you go backwards and you get to gun fu and suddenly you go, yeah, but what led to gun fu? Then you go to Asian cinema. But what led to all that? kind of action that starts leading you further back to the diehards and lethal weapons and james bond and jason bourne and etc and so forth so it was a very interesting process how it almost at least in my mind you had to do a backwards discovery of of sort of all the things leading ultimately to john wick you know yeah so. very much so yeah i mean I, I, one thing i will say about this book is that it is a uh it's it's like a bibliography for anybody who wants to look at the history of action cinema you, you, as you say the the domino effect is very very clear and you can go back and just be like well maybe i'll rent some john woo this weekend or maybe i'll you know go further i'll get some bruce lee you know it's it's very it's a very uh interesting thing to read just as a education um device uh yeah i mean you could have done a whole book about the matrix i mean obviously we talked about the matrix and the matrix is so important to john wick not only in terms of of sort of americanizing gun fu which was you know primarily something that was coming out of hong kong and asia but um it also uh was the place where keanu and chad and david you know sort of forged this bond and you know i don't think you have chad directing um John Wick, if he hadn't been Keanu's stunt double and they hadn't like bonded the way they did on the Matrix. And then, you know, the aesthetic of the Matrix in a very way, it shaped John Wick, both what they wanted to do and what they wanted to do differently, because John Wick is less, you know, fantasy than than um, the Matrix. So it's it's really interesting. But the Matrix is sort of key to the genesis of uh, of John Wick. I mean, what I thought was so interesting in, in the John Wick book um, you know, especially as somebody who's, you know, worked in film and TV for so long now as well, is listening to Basil talk about the reluctance, uh, how hard it was to get distribution and how the film almost fell apart so many times early on in its, um, you know, development and in production and how, you know, for a long time, people thought it was going to be sort of consigned to the dustbin of direct video or as we call it now, you know, direct to streaming and that it would never even, you know, it'd just be another action thriller you know with keanu reeves um because of course people forget yes he was huge in speed he was huge in the matrix but then he had a couple of you know failures or on i shouldn't say failures but films that were not financially successful um in the wake of the matrix and so there was no guarantee that like john wick would be this huge thing or even get distribution and it almost didn't well, let's let's talk about this a little bit about the, the the actual making of the movie and and how it all came about. I mean, what what what's fascinating 
uh, or one of one of the fascinating things about this book is listening to reading Derek Kolstad talk about uh, how he 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 almost rejects the premise that this is a hugely different movie that this is a you know everybody talks about how different and how game changing. John Wick is, but he, over and over again, he's like, no, no, it's it's all the familiar stuff. It's all the familiar yeah. stuff. I just put it together in a slightly different way for people. Yeah. I find Colstead really interesting. You know, I hadn't talked to Derek. I hadn't known Derek before um, interviewing for the book. And, you know, Nick Meyer once famously said, an overnight su- uh, success in Hollywood is 10 years, right? And Colstead is sort of proves that that axiom because he's a guy who wrote like these awful movies for like Dolph Lundgren and, you know, two in a barrel, you know, all this like low, you know, these really B, B, C level action movies. And then he, he explodes on the scene with John Wick. And then not only is he doing the sequels, but he's doing, you know, Captain America, Winter Soldier, uh, Falcon Winter Soldier. You know, he's doing all this other stuff. Suddenly, you know, he's just, you know, the go to guy for action movies in the business. And um, and 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 it's like, where did this guy come from? Well, he'd been working for like 10 years. He almost, you know, gave 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 up, uh, you know, went back home. And I mean, it's just so interesting. And even to see the evolution of the movie from you know, he'd written it as sort of like a an older 70 year old like Clint Eastwood type, um, you know, who gets pulled back in. And the fact that, you know, it's such a I mean, I think that, you know, it's such a testament to Keanu, Keanu that when he that he reads that he reads everything that he saw the script and saw an opportunity for him in what was then scorn um to to play this character when clearly it was written for a much older actor you know it's like Jonathan Banks is John Wick <laughs> you know and uh um so you know it really you really get an appreciation i think for keanu for derek for i mean there's a, there's a bunch of people you know hollywood gets a bad rap from a lot of people but it's like everyone you know had these great intentions and when you know basil starts talking about how the movie was going to basically fall apart and then he starts putting you know the production expenses on his credit card to keep it going you know his personal credit card that he's going to be on the hook for this thing if it falls apart which it really looked like it would when his, you know it's amazing i mean there are a million times where this movie could have fallen apart and not happened and then at the end of it they could have made it and maybe it wouldn't even gotten distribution had it not been for Lionsgate. yeah i it's the story of this movie getting distribution is one of the craziest things because i remember here i remember hearing the stories about the the initial uh screenings for distributors and how you know everybody was everybody who had made the movie was super excited for it and everybody was passing on it nobody could figure out why the test screenings are great you know, everybody, everybody loves this movie, but the distributors are all saying, eh, not for us. What what happened yeah. there? How did how did that how did Lionsgate wind up with this essentially gift of a franchise? Well, look, Lion, Lionsgate has a pipeline they need to feed. And, you know, not to say that this was given to them, but they made it, you know, sort of a, a P&A deal, which was like prints and advertising. They didn't really write a check for it. So they didn't have a lot a skin in the game. It was kind of like, okay, well, you know, it's an action movie. Keanu's in it. You know, we can hopefully make a few bucks on this, but we won't get hurt if we don't, you know? And uh, thankfully, because of Keanu, a Thunder Road, Basil's coming, you know, able to sell it internationally, you know, so that they could take the, the risk on, and they needed, you know, to help their international numbers have a domestic distributor. So, you know, Lionsgate kind of knows that too, um, that the value for them internationally goes up if there's a theatrical release in the US. So it was kind of a win-win for everybody. But I don't think Lionsgate necessarily had a, you know, there were people internally at Lionsgate who really believed in the movie, but I think as a company, I don't know if they had the kind of expectations uh, but then, of course, you know, what is it? Success has many fathers, failures and orphans sure. that had it failed, you know, it, <laughs> but but once it was successful, everyone was like, yo, we knew this was going to be a hit. And, you know, this is, you know, and, and so uh, it, it's so funny because they talk about how, you know, when you get to John Wick 2, there's a lot more interest internally from the company on you know in the in, in, in what what they're doing and what's going on and more notes and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a there's a great part in the book where uh, I'm I'm gonna butcher the name here. Is it Basil Ivanic? Yeah, I want yeah ba- ba- Basil Ivanic yeah. right. from Thunder Road. Yeah, the but the producer uh, who you guys have a bunch of uh, conversations with in this. I, I I love all of the stuff because I love the behind the scenes stuff and I love the the business the actual business of putting this thing together. But the thing I was I was uh, I was most struck by was him talking about shooting in New York. 
and the mm-hmm. and the uh, the value add of that, even though it's more expensive, just like the production value add of having New York as a backdrop, New York streets as uh, the the place where you're doing everything. Uh, when he is talking, when he is talking about the gap in the market in the twenty five million dollar plus or minus five million uh, action movie. Um, and he's shooting in New York City. I, like, how does he pull this off? I like, I don't. I honestly, I look at this movie and I, I am still kind of struck by the fact that wow, this is a twenty to twenty five million dollar yeah. movie. It looks like a forty or fifty million dollar movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he he talks about that. I mean, obviously, it's very tough and very expensive to shoot in New York, but he they were very smart to shoot there because he said it, it, it's absolutely right. Yeah, you could go and do it cheaper in Toronto and you have your establishing shot of New York and then all of a sudden you're somewhere where clearly it's not New York. I mean, it's like the Superman 2 effect, right? You know, where it's like, oh, this is supposed to be Metropolis, right? It's supposed to be New York. But you're in England shooting and like the taxis don't look the same. And nothing, it just, it's something off. You know, you know, even if, if you don't aren't thinking about it, just subliminally, you know, it's not New York. And, you know, what he's right is they're buying all this production value because if Keanu is standing in front of the Williamsburg Bridge or the Flatiron Building or, you know, going down the, the streets, you know, at night and it's just New York is New York and it's it's totally iconic. And, you know, New York and Paris are probably the best, the most shot and most well-known and iconic cities in the world. And you just get something out. And particularly when you're doing a noir story, you got to do a, a real city, you know, that like New York or L.A., you, you, you can't be doubling it Canada for New York. Um, and uh, I think it was a very smart decision because most producers would look at the budget and run because they know New York, the budget's going to go up, they're going to get killed, you know, um, there's going to be overages, there are going to be problems, there's going to be a lot of courtesy payments to shut people up and make them go away. And, um, it, it, you know, it's it's really tough. But I think it helped that also Basil um, is a New Jer- from New Jersey, so he, he, you know, is already like in the East Coast, like knows the value of being on the East Coast. But I think that, you know, David and Chad, you know, also realize that just visually, you know, nothing compares to New York. That's why all the movies have always found these great, very visual cities to shoot in. I mean, John Wick 2 has Rome, you know, John Wick 3 with Morocco. I mean, they're very smart because it's like you can't build that. You know, you have to go there. And I don't care how sophisticated, you know, the video walls get, you know, the volume, you know, eventually we'll be, oh, we'll just be, you know, in a sound stage and it'll all be on, you know, these video walls and you'll, you will never have to leave the stage. Bullshit. Yeah. You know, fine for the Mandalorian, for TV. Great. But you will never have the sense of really being on a location through visual effects. It just never will get this, whether it's the grains of sand or the wind or whatever, it's just never the same thing. You know, part of this thing with this mo- these movies, but really the first one is this amazing combination. You, mer- you mentioned Derek's script before, and it was a very different kind of script. Then you get Chad and, and uh, David coming in as directors who are bringing an energy to it that the genre hadn't seen in a long time. And they've got 8711, and you've got these stunt guys doing stunts un- unlike anybody else doing stunts, involving their leading man in a way that really wasn't being done. So you've got all of these different elements that are unique coming together for this relatively low budget movie. And somehow all of those pieces, including the location shooting we were just talking about, just makes this thing explode and creates a universe, basically, apart from everything else. Ed, you mentioned 8711, and I want to talk about that a little bit because this is another very uh, interesting subcurrent of the book is the the creation of um, – I, I don't even know what, what, how you would describe it exactly. Not not studio, but not really the stunt team. I, what, how would you describe 8711 and what uh, Chad Stileski and, and David, David – is it Leach or Lech? Leach. Leach. David Leach are, are doing uh, in terms of – Stunt work, fight coordination, choreography. How How is what they are doing different than what everybody else is doing? They're dedicated to this one thing. I mean, I think so. I mean, outside of the projects that they're making, but their team that they've put together are, it's like an army unit or something. You know, that's all they do is they work together. They create these things. They say, okay, how are we doing this that's different from the last one? So it's not just a bunch of stunt guys coming together to work on, on a movie. This is a team that is trained basically for specifically this sort of thing. Yeah, but really comes through in your interviews with them is the passion oh God, they yes. have for what they do and how much they love it and how much they don't want to repeat themselves. Like this is not just a job. 
You know, it's what was the, the, the military? It's not just a job, it's an adventure. But it's like for them, it's it, it, it really is an adventure. And they're all, you know, filmmakers in their own rights. A lot of these guys are going off to direct their own movies. And I think they were really inspired by the case of Chad and David, who were stunt people who became directors. You very rarely see that. You see cinematographers become directors and editors become directors and even sometimes visual effects guys, but never stuntmen. So um, the fact that they not only became directors, but incredibly successful, bankable directors. Like David Leach is doing Bullet Train, a huge movie for yep. Sony that comes out. You know, he did Deadpool 2. Um, you know, Chad keeps doing these John Wick movies, which keep going up. But there are very few people who can get a movie greenlit in this town. And now both of them can. So I think there's a huge... Those guys are hugely, um, they're the North Star for a lot of these stunt guys, and they want to please them. But they also, the other thing that came, love Keanu so much because he's down in the trenches and, you know, by all accounts, just the nicest guy in the world, probably the nicest star in Hollywood. That everyone will, you know, they throw themselves in front of a moving bus for Keanu. So, you know, it, it, they say a fish stinks from its head. Like, this is a case where, like, number one on the call sheet inspires everybody to do their best work. And so when you say, how did they do this on $25 million for the um, first John Wick? You know, I think it was a combination of, like, these were people that, you know, you wanted to work for and give your A game and be your best. And, um, you know, everybody had a lot to prove, and they did. And Keanu, I got to say, that man trained supposedly for four or five months before filming even began to make sure that his face was the one we would see and it wasn't CG'd on like a stunt body. Uh, you know, it was Keanu putting his heart and soul in. Like Mark said, you start with that when everybody else is inspired to do the same thing. I mean, uh, it was a J.J. Perry, one of the, the main stunt guys, said that, Prior to John Wick, he had gone to, um, oh, now I'm going to forget his name, uh, Jason Statham, and and said, uh, mm -hmm. said, hey, I have this great idea of these different things we can do. And Statham basically turned around and goes, mm, I'd rather do what I'm more comfortable with, rather than. Right. Yeah. Well, and they also told you the story about how in movies like Fast and the Furious, it's like, it's just like, okay, just send in my stunt double, right. they'll do all that, right? And, you know, I don't want to do the, all the prep and all the work with Keanu. It's except for the dangerous stuff. It's Keanu, and this is a guy in his mid fifties. I don't know how he is able to do it. It's extraordinary. Yeah, one of the things that you guys uh, that you guys write about this uh, in the in this book is the 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 way that they craft stunt sequences before they have a movie for it. Essentially, they they're putting together choreography before they even have a movie to put it in, which is very interesting to me. I mean, it feels like almost backwards. But makes some intuitive sense. No, it, ma it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, in this, when you're working with really good stunt groups, it, it, sometimes that does. I mean, I, I had a little of that. I did a show for TNT called Agent X, which was, had a lot of action. And the stunt guys were extraordinary. They did a lot of the Marvel movies. And sometimes they would just put together, you know, ideas for fights. And they would come into the writer's room and, and show us animatics. And it was like, oh, that's really cool. Let's, let's put that in, a, in, in an episode and especially when you're on a tight schedule it really helps to say okay and there's also stuff they just want to try you know they haven't done before and it's like wait we can do this it'd be really cool so we were sent videos of these guys just practicing everything that you'll see in the movie like in, in the first john wick you see these guys taking those falls you see them flipping over each other doing basically and picking up fake guns and shooting that i mean it's it's incredible the amount of detail that goes into their choreography before the cameras are even rolling. They're just mm -hmm. doing it for themselves. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Gun Fu is, you know, it's been called balletic, you know, in the way that something like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, sort of the, 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 um, it, you know, is balletic, except it's a ballet with guns, but it's all choreographed. So it's like a ballet. It's, it, it's, it's all about the choreography. I mean, stunts are all about the choreography and, um, you know, Gun Fu is all about the choreography and it's just a marvel. I mean, I remember sitting there and sit, watching John Wick for the first time, especially that red circle scene and just thinking, holy mackerel, this is unbelievable. Truly amazing. Uh, as I mean, as a producer yourself, uh, Mark, um, when you're watching these movies, what is what jumps out at you as like, this is what makes this special as opposed to, you know, other stuff that we see on TV or you know what what jumps out at you as a as a well, you know as as I mean, a creator I'm, of stuff i'm i'm a sucker for film noir as a fan you know so the fact that this is sort of elevated neo noir on um, but 
in a in a totally different you know because it, it plays with light and shadow and i particularly love the aesthetic that that the the director of photographies have created on all three films um and i'm sure the fourth as well uh it's a very you know sort of hyper kinetic hyper real kind of world and yet it's still grounded as as insane as it is it feels like this could be, you know, it's our world. It's not a fantasy world. It's not, uh, they're not going to Mordor. You know, it, it's like, wow, all this stuff's happening in New York while we're going to work and while we're doing this stuff. But I, yeah, it, one of the reasons that I so was interested in sort of writing this book was sort of understanding how, it's what you asked before, how the f did you do t for $25 million, make this movie in New York? It feels big and lived in, and you know it created a, an amazing world out of whole cloth, and um, uh, you know with these great performances, and um, and it's great because you know just talking to everybody, whether it be the DP or the editors, um, they all felt the same way. They all were just like really excited. Yeah, you know, sometimes when you're working on a project, you just know that this is special. And I think that they all felt like the first John Wick was special. And sometimes you think that and then, you know, the movie goes straight to video or it doesn't get the reception, the critical reception. What happens was this is one that was validated where they all thought it was special. And then it was all validated by um, the um, response, you know, critically by the fans, the fact that a, a second film was greenlit so quickly. And then it really helped everyone's careers. It's one of those films that just not just the directors, but, you know, the editors, the DPs, you know, costume designers, they all, you know, were moving on to bigger, you know, A-list movies. And, and and people are always grateful. That's a huge validation of a film success. As well as the fact we've got John Wick 4 coming out next year. We've got the TV show coming, the limited TV show prequel series. Uh, we've got now a spinoff movie, The Ballerina, in, in the development. I mean, it's amazing to watch from that first movie how all of this is springing from a movie that, by all rights, shouldn't have connected with people, and yet it did. And it's, it's again, it's created this whole universe. Of, uh, yeah. Plus, you know, there, there's also, you love, you know, so that whole idea of going against the odds. Everyone was saying this movie's not going to work. We're not going to distribute it. You know, we don't like it. They had walkouts during the screening, you know, at the and. and and, and and so there, there's a certain amount of vindication when it's not only successful, but it's super successful. Yeah, you know, because it's a movie that um, they 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 owned. You know, it wasn't picked up for worldwide distribution. So you know, as Basil says in the book, I mean, you know, he made crazy money off of this. They all made crazy money off of this thing, and so that's nice because when you put everything on the line and are rewarded for it. There's a certain amount of uh, it's not I told you so, but it's just like a sigh of relief. And like, I'm I'm glad I can trust myself because everybody has that imposter syndrome. Right. So when you believe in something so much and it hits, it's like, oh, maybe I do know something. Maybe I'm not an idiot. Yeah, I feel I, I sympathize with that. Uh, I sympathize <laughs> with that. I uh, it's funny. You you mentioned the fourth movie, uh, which uh, obviously I, I've not seen. Have you guys have you guys seen it? Can you tell? Can you tell us what happens? No, we haven't seen it. I mean, unless Ed, you saw it. <laughs> no, they, you they didn't the like me that much. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, but oh. so you're 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 doing you're doing an oral history on uh, on a project that is essentially I mean, the, the, the movies are still coming out. You know, you've got mm -hmm. these TV shows. How is that different than doing? something like an oral history of star trek which again like is kind of it, they're still making star trek stuff you know paramount plus have tv shows etc but you know it, there there was a moment where it kind of looked like star trek was done uh and 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 this is very different how do you how do you work differently in those two situations i don't know it was not unlike uh, james bond you know, um, where, you know, No Time to Die was in production when we were writing the book. And obviously we didn't have a lot of access to the new movie. I mean, same thing with this. I mean, I, they, they were very candid with me about stuff that was going on with John Wick 4. And, you know, we didn't put a ton of it in there because obviously things changed by the time the book came out. You know, the, the movie was supposed to be out concurrent with the book. Right. So um, plus they do a lot of reshooting. So, like, the stuff could change. Um uh, you know, so, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I think it's kind of like writing a book about Star Wars. The most interesting thing is really, you know, the beginning is a very delicate time, as they say in Dune. You know, the beginning for Star Wars was, it's the genesis. It's the same thing with, I think the most interesting things in the John Wick story are making that first movie. 
Like, I think, you know, I think it's fine. It's interesting. Uh, two and three, we have great stories and stuff. But for me, the heart of the book, the most interesting story is that first, because that was the one that proved this was a franchise that, that you know, that was the hard one, right? Even though making none of the movies have been easy, but that was the, the hard right. one. Right. And, um, and so I, I, I think it's like, it's John Wick four, five, six, seven, whatever goes on. It, it doesn't interest me as, as much. You know, if they came to us and said, oh, do you want to update the book for the paperback version, include John Wick? Fine, we do that. But like, I don't feel the book is missing something by not going into depth on John Wick 4, just as I don't feel like the Bond book is any less com- comprehensive by not going into No Time to Die. In fact, it's just as well that I hadn't seen No Time to Die before writing that book because I may have lost my interest in James <laughs> Bond entirely. Oh. oh. <laughs> and, you know, the, one of the big differences, too, when you're doing something like Star Trek or when we did Battlestar Galactica, for instance, the historical looking back, like the dust is settled, we can assess what we did and get that perspective now, which is very different from when you're actually making the thing when it's actually in production. And yes, we got that for John Wick 1, but as you get into the sequels and stuff, there's still not that perspective looking backwards, really, beyond saying, oh yeah, I remember the last month when I did this, as opposed to, oh man, back 30 years ago or 20 years ago when we were doing this, this is what happened, this is what I remember happening. Uh, and they're much more candid when you're talking about historical things rather than current things. That's Although true. these guys were pretty candid yeah. in this book, but that's my that's my feeling yeah. about the difference. Yeah. We've never done a book on Marvel, but I, I had somebody, I, we knew somebody who was, and they said, you know, it's impossible to get anyone to talk. Like, even the PAs are under NDAs. And I'm like, well, that doesn't surprise me. But what Ed's saying is, it's true. It is harder, you know, when things aren't historical to get people to talk about the current things. Even we saw that with the Star Trek book. Our book is incredibly comprehensive and ridiculously in depth. But when we started talking about the JJ stuff, it was harder to get people to be honest. And I've, I've, I have one regret about that book. It's, it's, I feel like that is a little press releasey, you know, um, because people weren't being as honest as they could um, because they all want, are worried about their next job. As opposed to at the time, you know, people were talking to us, uh, you know, where they, this was long before there was ever a Picard or, you know, bringing Janeway back for, you know, it's like, so people were very happy to talk because they, as they figured their version of Star Trek was long gone and would never come back and they could be honest and candid. Like even now, I think if we were interviewing a lot of the people we interviewed back then, they probably wouldn't be yeah. as candid because they think, oh, maybe they'll bring me back for the new shows, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, it was just the right time to write that book. But yeah, it's much harder covering something that's contemporary that or, you know, that's in production now. Like I would never in a million years do a book about Marvel. Like I know it's 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 impossible. Right. Um, you know, it was hard enough to do the Star Wars book. Like anything historical, great. We were able to do prequels, you know, but the sequels very difficult, you know, to have yeah. access or the new shows to have access to people who uh, were willing to talk or who, who could talk on the record. And we don't really do off the record stuff because it's an oral history. You know, untitled gaffer yeah, right. said, you know, yeah, right. it's like yeah. you know. Exactly. Uh, well, that was that was pretty much everything uh, I'd wanted to ask. Um, I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. If there's anything that you think folks should know about uh, your book, John Wick, uh, whatever, whatever else is going on in the world. Well, I would like to say if, if people, you know, hang on every every episode and are listening to your episode the day it drops, then uh, tomorrow, Friday, the uh, what is it? The 22nd. Uh, we're going to be at San Diego Comic Con doing a panel on this very book. They shouldn't have killed his dog <laughs> uh, at four o'clock. Um, and we hope you'll join us. I'm moderated by the great movie Mance. And uh, we'll then be at the uh, St. Martin's slash McMillan boat booth where we'll be signing copies of the book, which um, is a rare chance to see us in the wild uh, together because, you know, we don't uh, we're on different coasts. We rarely do promotional appearances together. So if somebody wants to get us to both to sign the book, this is a good opportunity. And obviously, if they want to bring any of our previous books, we will happily sign them. We're not those guys who say, oh, yeah, we need twenty dollars, please. to <laughs> okay. sign." It's like, I'm happy you bought the book. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're, we're more than happy to sign it, you know, and as long as you keep a safe distance. Uh, that's right. San Diego Comic-Con Friday, uh, tomorrow. Uh, hopefully, hopefully yeah, we get yeah, this, this post every time. Uh, so go, go check it out, uh, and pick up, pick up a copy of the book. I'm going to put a link to the Amazon page and all that. Yeah. It, just, it just came it out, out on Tuesday. So, uh, it just came out and, um, it'll be interesting how it does because, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, all these, these franchises, you know, have such a huge following. 
it'll be interesting because John Wick is such a visual film, right? And we talk a lot about the stunts and about the the pyrotechnics and all. And that was another reason I thought it was important to cover the history of Kung Fu. Because if you were just writing about John Wick, like, wh- how how is this going to be more dynamic than VAM, you know, uh, uh, on the DVD, where you can actually see this stuff, right? So I feel like we did a really good job of making it something really interesting where it's like you couldn't do this in a DVD bonus commentary, but it'll be, it'd be interesting to see if the, if the, the fans of John Wick turn out, but I think it's a much more complex and deep and interesting book than just the making of John Wick. As you said, I mean, the, the whole gun history of gun fu and action movies. And so these legendary figures in, in action and, um, it was it was it was it was this was a it was a tough one to write and it was an easy one to write at the same time which I know sounds weird but it it, it it's but that's how I would describe it Ed it would, I it, absolutely I would. Mean, it was tough but yeah. easy it was both those things and I was amazed that even though it's smaller than a lot of our other books both Mark and I have carried on to each other just about how good this book is I mean are we allowed to say that about our own book but yes that, yeah, absolutely but this book feels I will vouch for it. so what'd you say. <laughs> But but to hold yeah. to read the book and look over it again, you just realize it accomplishes so much in a relatively small space compared to the other books. And I got to give our publishers a shout out, which I rarely do, um, I, I, that um, the cover is so good. The graphic like the, the, the art direction on this book, which hasn't always been the case on some of our previous books, is extraordinary. I mean, it's a gorgeous cover. The interior design is be- it looks like it like. 2022 a book coming out in 2022 as opposed to 1978 like some of our previous books so um it, i'm really so excited about um it and they've been really supportive and great we have a great editor um and i again i don't want to fall into that star trek uh 2009 hyperbole that we fell prey to in the star trek but really our editor has been a real champ we've, we've been very lucky with the editors we've had um, who who get this stuff and are into pop culture and understand the market for these books because you know a lot of companies they're very rarefied and very you know hoity toity and it's like um, you know we're only going to print uh, Kurt Vonnegut you know it's like uh, whatever but um, you know they, they get the whole idea of like the Star Trek and Star Wars which you know could be considered sort of D class A in New York publishing circles and you know certainly like oh we want to cover Battlestar Galactica what what's that so um so it's been a, it's been a good run and uh you know I really enjoyed doing these books with Ed obviously he is a you know just a great entertainment journalist and has been doing this for a long time we have a lot of fun doing them so uh, I hope people check out the book and they can follow um, uh, certainly me on, on Twitter at Mark A. Altman. And if they're a fan of Star Trek, my podcast in Glorious Trexperts, which is like um, Trek movie called the best Star Trek podcast of 2021. And of course, we'd love to see you guys at a distance at Comic-Con at this distance. weekend. Right. Keep your keep your space, folks. Six feet. Uh, yeah. Uh, make sure. Yeah, just throw. Exactly. Do they just like lob yeah. the book to yeah. the table? We have somebody yeah, yeah, there exactly. catching them okay. for us. So yeah, okay. you know, we'll we'll have have somebody who can take it and hand it to us, and then we'll sign it, <laughs> toss it back, and uh, and and then, right, and then we'll toss it back. We'll knock over a few people. Oops, sorry, but uh, we, we, you know that'll be the real gun foo. It'll be book foo. foo. We'll yeah, be throwing books at people and seeing who we can knock out with the. I wouldn't want to get hit with that Star Trek book. The John yeah, Wick, no. you, you might be right survive. With John Wick. The but the the Star Trek book, I think you die. Yeah, yeah. So, that'd be a, anyway. that, at least a concussion. You, you'll be on the, <laughs> at the least the a IR concussion. For a while. Exactly. Well, Sonny, thanks for having us on the show. This was fun. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, thanks again for being on the show again. Name of the dog uh, movie. The name of the dog. Name of the name movie. Of the book. They shouldn't have killed the dog. Book. Name of the name. Of the See, I can't even do. I can't even. I'm 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 too focused on the accent here. Uh, anyway, they shouldn't have killed this dog. Uh, by Edward Gross, Mark A. Altman. Check it out. Amazon, wherever books are sold. Uh, you will enjoy it if you enjoy the John Wick movies, or even if you just want a good primer on gun fu and martial arts movies history. Um, uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at the Bulwark, and I'll be back next week with another episode. See you guys then. <laughs> Music 
you loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Last night, Lisa wanted to clean out the fridge. And I was like, I can't lift anything. I'm not helping. Number one, Lala was told she can't lift anything, you guys. So it's not like she's just like, I'm not lifting anything. She no, but I'm told. not helping. But even, just, my, even my friends know. I'll write you a check. I'll okay. do some Venmo. I'll have something wired. <laughs> I am not helping. I don't like it. Give them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.